KSMQ Health Connections, local healthcare providers answering your medical questions. This week's topic, All in the Head. Good evening and welcome to KSMQ Health Connections where we connect you with some of the finest minds in the medical field. I'm Eric Olson, thanks for tuning in. Tonight we're going to talk about a group of illnesses that affect one out of every five of us and yet the illness is something many of us don't want to talk about. Why do you think people are embarrassed to talk about mental health? There's a stigma associated with it in terms of uh, you make yourself vulnerable. My guess is that lots of people are, they're worried about the stigma to it, but, and they're also, they don't understand what all mental illness is. And lots of it deals with stresses and people can have mental illness at one point in their life and not later on. I mean, I think it's hard for people to talk about a sickness and somehow mental health has got more of a stigma, I think, than saying I've got cancer. I think that's a stigma from way back when, when, when we all talked about the loony house or being dumb or stupid or there's a lot of stigma. I see this stigma a lot like because they can't get help. They, they don't know who to turn to, where to go. Well, we are going to talk about mental illness tonight. Our guest, Dr. Karen Blacker. She's a psychiatrist at Mayo Clinic Health System. Thank you very much for joining us. Pleasure to have you. I, I uh, wonder, we hope you'll join in the conversation. We have a lot of questions here, but we want to hear from you first. If you have a question for Dr. Blacker, phone number is 888-255-0121, or you can email us live right now at healthconnections.org. We have several registered nurses who are here to handle your calls. One of them is Jen Dalliger. Jen works at Sacred Heart Care Center in Austin proud graduate of Riverland Community College's nursing program. Uh, speaking of phone numbers, a couple of times during the show we're going to post phone numbers and contact information for organizations that provide help. You might want to grab a pen and paper for that. Just jot down some ideas. We'll have the first list for you in about 10 minutes. But we're going to start tonight, as we often do, with a look at some hard numbers, and they are quite sobering. So many times when people think about mental illness, they think about serious ones, but relatively rare. Schizophrenia and bipolar, for instance, they are serious problems, but you can see the percentage of adults is significant, but relatively small. Then take a look at depression. Almost 7% of all adults suffered some type of major depressive event in the past 12 months. Biggest problem in terms of numbers that we see, anxiety, 18%, that's almost one in five, suffer some type of anxiety disorder at some point. And it's not just adults. 21% of all teenagers have a serious mental disorder at some point between the ages of 13 and 18. And for young people, young folks in the juvenile justice system, that number is 70%, 70, 70% have a mental illness of some type. Finally, our last set of numbers, particularly uh, sobering, 123 Americans commit suicide every day. It is the 10th leading cause of death in this country, and for young adults, it's the second leading cause of death. Lots to talk about. Again, you can take part in the conversation. Give us a call, give us an email, 888-255-0121. Doctor, thanks for joining us. Looking at all those numbers, a whirlwind through. For the young people, the suicide rate, is that a, has that been steady or are those numbers rising? Have we always had these kinds of problems? Unfortunately, we've seen an increase in suicides in younger people. Um, the causes for that are not yet clear. There's a lot of research urgently trying to find out why is this happening. But yes, sadly, it is, it is a growing problem. Hmm. And, and probably not just in our country, but maybe, is it everywhere that you know of? There or? are worldwide increases in suicide. They vary country to country, but the United States has seen an increase, especially in that younger demographic. Let's talk a little bit about what you do uh, mm -hmm. in Rochester and Austin, Albert Lee. Yep. What kind of service do you provide? So here in Austin, I work at the Mayo Clinic Health System where I see adult outpatients. Um, what that means is I predominantly work on medication management. Um, so my practice is very much around 
which medications might be beneficial for symptoms. But a lot of the people I work with are my colleagues in the psychology department who provide therapy as well. All right, and you do that here, and then you also do some research, mm -hmm. also in your spare time. <laughs> in my I'm spare time. Kidding. Uh, and into uh, things like PTSD mm -hmm. yep. and epigenetics. Yes, so um, epigenetics is with the control switches of genes and what turns them on and what turns them off and how, how might that influence mental health issues. All right, that's very exciting. Uh, Jen has a question, I believe. Do you have a viewer question? Go ahead. Yes, we sure do. Along those lines, Nathan from Byron called in and he is wondering, he says sometimes he gets really down and he's wondering when he should consider getting help. How do you know? Great question, mm -hmm. because you can't see it. Yep. Like so many diseases where you can, you're not feeling really yep. well or you don't look that well, you're sick. Uh, here you don't really know. What, so what signs, if you're just feeling down, what's the difference? Sure, um, thanks Eric, that's such an important question. I think if you're wondering whether you need help, then that alone might be the, the answer, yes. Um, you're right that there's very few physical signs for many of the mental illnesses. Um, but one of the things we look for is impairment in functioning. Is it getting harder and harder to do the stuff you have to do every day? Is it getting harder to go to work, go to school, maintain relationships, meet deadlines? Um, and then one of the more urgent problems is, is safety becoming a problem? In other words, is a person starting to have thoughts of hurting themselves or killing themselves? That's an emergency. And you know, we would recommend that at that point, reach out for help. It doesn't matter whether you're a kid, a teenager, or an adult. You can go to a trusted adult friend, a teacher, you can call 911, you can go straight to the emergency room. The main thing is keeping yourself safe because then you can build on that and try and help alleviate somebody's symptoms. And parents of adolescents go through a whole roller coaster of emotions with yep. many of, of their children. So it's tough, isn't it, to, mm -hmm. uh, as, the, as the caregiver, parent or guardian, to know. Absolutely. Adolescence is such a chaotic, just amazing time. Your brain is developing, you're growing, you're getting your sense of self, who are you, what are your values, what's your identity? And that's a rough road for anybody, as we all remember. Um, but I think sometimes on top of that, mental illness can get in the way. Um, anxiety, maybe struggling to go to school, um, maybe depression, difficult to get up in the morning, difficult to finish homework. When you see that impairment in functioning, maybe that's a time to have a chat, a simple chat as a family, or maybe go to a trusted primary care provider, perhaps even seek psychiatric care. And in the schools, many schools have good uh, programs or first, uh, you know, with an educator yeah. or with a professional, a nurse of some kind, yep. if you feel a trusted teacher, perhaps. Yep, absolutely. Teachers and counselors are often one of the sources of outpatient referrals to child and adolescent psychiatry clinics. Okay, oh yeah. really? Yep. Okay, and obviously you are very busy. Uh, our, is our region, uh, we need more people in the mental health field, mm -hmm. mental health care workers. It, it could be a career for somebody helping people. Nationally, we have a shortage of mental health providers, and that's not just psychiatry MDs, that's not just going through med school and, and becoming a medication management doc. It's also psychologists and social workers and therapists. We, we need people who are able to support patients as they go through these difficulties. And if somebody has a mental illness when they're young, uh, does that usually, what's the length? I suppose it's hard to generalize, but would they have it for X number of years, or is it a gateway? It leads to greater and greater illnesses? You're right that that's a complex question, and you're also right when you say it depends very much on what we're talking about. Um, some things are very treatable, some things I'd, I'd say are curable. Uh, phobia is a classic example. Kids might have a phobia of the next door neighbor's dog, phobia of water and swimming pools, and um, those can be much easier to treat than perhaps the, the more chronic, more, you know, arguably longer term illnesses that go on sometimes for life. A lot of mental illnesses, it's not a question of curing, it's a question of learning to manage, like a chronic m physical illness such as diabetes. You have to get that mindset. Yep. Thanks, doctor. Very fascinating answers already. If you just joined us, this is KSMQ Health Connections. 
We're speaking about mental health tonight. Our guest is Dr. Karen Blacker, a psychiatrist with Mayo Clinic Health System. Our phone number and email address are on the bottom of the screen, but now some phone numbers and information for groups that are able to help. of Mayo Clinic Health System talking about mental illness. Call us or email us with your questions. The brain, as I understand it, is very adaptable. It's malleable. It's plastic. Uh, what happens to that brain during an, a mental illness episode? Again, that's a complicated question, um, and it's a fascinating question that lots of researchers all over the planet are looking at. The answer is going to depend a little bit on the mental illness that we're talking about. Um, speaking in very general terms, what we're looking at in different kinds of mental illness are changes on the chemical level inside nerve cells of the brain. We're looking at changes in how those nerve cells communicate with each other. Most commonly with little chemical signals called neurotransmitters. A lot of the antidepressant medicines that we use try and increase levels of neurotransmitters so that cells can communicate with each other more effectively. Another area of research is looking at what we call neurocircuits. So neurocircuits, if you think of them as areas of the brain that communicate with each other quite frequently, and several of these circuits might be involved in any one particular mood disorder. Um, and then we look at things like the influence of outside influences like uh, the environment, stress, um, bad things happening to somebody, trauma, and medical problems can influence mental illness too. For sure. example, chronic health conditions, ones that may even directly affect the brain, like certain things like thyroid disease. All right, complicated. Yep. Like all of it, but yep. uh, fascinating. Uh, Jen has a viewer call. Jen, take it away. Yes, hi, I had a call and they were wondering how do you incorporate peer support in treatment and what community resources are available out there? Peer support. Support, that's a term you know. <laughs> I don't know what it is, so take it away. So again, this, this has different levels to it. On, on one level, you know, so many of the people you stopped on the street at the beginning in that video clip you played were talking about stigma and how for a long time it's been very difficult as a society to reach out and ask for help from friends, from family, from employers, co-workers, because of the fear that people might think differently about you if you have a mental illness. And I think being a good friend, a good support is trying to be there for someone and be as non-judgmental as possible, be willing to help somebody find the resources they need. But speaking more specifically, um, peer support can be a way for other people who have either directly struggled with mental illness themselves or have been very close to someone who has. They've been through the experience of seeking mental health resources who can guide someone who's new to that process through that same journey. Um, one of the organizations that is really helpful in that is NAMI, the National Alliance of Mental Illness. And I think that's one of the phone numbers that you're showing right. tonight. So NAMI offers a lot of peer support um, on a group level, sometimes on an individual level. And we have quite a few NAMI groups here in Minnesota. Right, and one they in Rochester have, for sure. Yeah, lots of resources on their webpage, a huge treasure trove of information for friends, for family, for patients themselves. Thank you. Uh, there you go. Jen, take it away. Yes, hi, I had a call from Tammy and Elbert Lee. She's wondering, her. she recently lost a spouse and has two children, five and 10 years old. She's wondering about um, 
grief support and the different things. How do you know when your children need um, maybe something further? Um, she's just kind of at a loss and, and really just trying to fill, find her way through this herself, let alone um, the right help at the right time for her children. Thank you, Jen. So we're talking about trauma within a family unit and specifically how it, how it may or may not affect a young person. How would you, how would you go forward on yeah. that? And I'm sorry, it, it's sad and it's hard on families when that happens. Um, there's several aspects to that. The first one is I would say it's really important for the adults to look after themselves. It's hard to be there for the kids when you're struggling yourself. And so, you know, I say this to my parents when I deal with them in clinic, make sure that you do take time to check, are you okay? And if you're not okay, ask for help. And that might just be your friends, your family. Maybe it'll be on a, on a more formal level, like someone professional, perhaps primary care, perhaps psychiatry, perhaps a therapist. The question about how do you then help the children? Um, you know, it's, it's interesting that that example included two quite different ages. A five-year-old is going to handle grief very differently from a 10-year-old. Mm. And even individual children at the same age are gonna handle grief differently. You mentioned trauma. I don't know the background to this story. I know it's tragic, um, but there may have been an added level of trauma too. I think general advice, again, without being able to be more specific, is looking for impairment in functioning. And what's the functioning of a five-year-old or a 10-year-old or a 15-year-old? Are they able to do what's normal for kids their age? Are they able to go to school? Are they struggling to sleep at night? Um, are they having nightmares? Bad ones? Is it starting to impact how they can get through their day? Those are the kind of things you'd be looking for. And kids are resilient. Kids are able to cope with things that, that I think would give adults pause. But kids need help too sometimes, and it's okay to ask for that. And it's okay to speak to your pediatrician and say, hey, Am I doing this right, or should I think of something else? Thank you, doctor, and hope that helped, and sorry for uh, your loss. Uh, Jen Dalliger is an RN in Austin. She has another caller for us. Yes, I do. Um, Patty from Glenville has called, and she's wondering, um, can lack of sleep cause mental health conditions? That is a really interesting question. Oh, no. <laughs> They're all complex, aren't they? The short answer is yes, yes. Uh, lack of sleep can cause symptoms consistent with mental illness. Um, lack of sleep can, can change your immune system, it can change your brain chemistry, can change your brain function, um, and we know this to be true. But in certain conditions, it's actually quite serious. For example, bipolar disorder is a mood disorder where a person may, may have episodes where they are depressed but they may also have episodes where they are either full of energy, don't need much sleep, or perhaps it becomes even more concerning. They start to see things or hear things or believe things that can't be true. And one of the triggers for one of those hypomanic or manic episodes can actually be a lack of sleep. So patients who have bipolar disorder, we tell them it's really important you get enough sleep every night. And if you're struggling, get in touch. That in and of itself can yep. show that there's a problem maybe yep. that needs to get checked. Thank you, doctor, so interesting. We have about seven minutes to go. Still time for you to give us a call with your questions. Dr. Karen Blacker is with Mayo Clinic Health System. Our number is 888-255-0121. And you can email us as well, healthconnections at ksmq.org. Here are some more phone numbers and resource materials for you.
Welcome back. We are taking your calls and we're taking your emails. We were talking before the show, you treat a lot of folks in the agriculture farm mm -hmm. uh, sector, mm -hmm. and that's also a growing segment of your practice. Yes, especially in a place like Austin where you do have um, a more rural community. Um, and one of the things we were talking about before the show was uh, how it's been difficult for farmers, especially I'd say the last couple of decades as there's been a move from small farms to much bigger agricultural industry. Um, it's a lot more difficult to compete in not just an industrialized system, but a global system. Um, and so often people are affected directly by things that are completely outside their control. I mean, for millennia that's included the weather, but now it includes things like seed price, um, return on crops. And you're trying to provide for your family, so it's yep. very, very stressful. Yep. And plan for next year's business. Um, Jen has a question. Go ahead, Jen. Yes, hi. Um, can a person diagnosed with bipolar disorder and I guess schizophrenia recover, or maybe that's safe to say any mental illness, um, can they recover to the point where they don't need medication? Is there ever a point where that becomes um, not needed? So, a cure. Well, we touched on earlier that a lot of mental illnesses can't be cured uh, easily and that they are more like managing a chronic health condition. And f again, without knowing the person's specifics, I have to say that in general, diseases, conditions like bipolar disorder and schizophrenia do tend to need lifelong medications. That might change in the future, but right now, people tend to need medications in bipolar disorder that prevent those lows of depression and those highs of hypomania or mania. Um, in diseases like schizophrenia, where a person may be struggling with constant psychotic symptoms, in other words, different for everybody, but may include hallucinations or believing things that can't be true or difficulty perceiving reality accurately. Not only does it help them function to stay on medications that reduce those symptoms, but it also protects their brain because there's some evidence that if you leave psychosis untreated, it can cause brain inflammation and that that in turn can lead to some cognitive problems, some long-term thinking problems. And I know we've been talking about a lot of problems tonight, but the, uh, your industry, your business, has really made great strides in, over the years in helping people and saving lives. Uh, what's on the horizon as far as research and what new things might be coming? Sure. I think the first thing to emphasize is even though I'm a psychiatrist who specializes in medication management, medication is almost never on its own the only answer. It's so important to have things like good self-care, and that includes a good routine, looking after yourself, exercise, friends, work, structure, schedule. Therapy can be huge, and depending on the, depending on the type of condition being treated, certain types of therapy are gonna be recommended above others. Now, the reason I say that is when you're asking what's on the future, research is going on into all of those things. So there's research into how does the brain work? You know, what's happening to those brain cells in different kinds of conditions? Um, can we spot them early before the person even has symptoms? Can we prevent these conditions one day? If we, if we can find them earlier, perhaps we can start treating them before they become too serious. Uh, what kinds of therapy can be most helpful for people? Are there new kinds of therapy that we can use? And then coming into the picture are the what we call neuromodulation treatments. So neuromodulation means things that can change how the brain functions, how the nerve cells fire, how the brain grows. And that might include things like TMS, transcranial magnetic stimulation, which is this fairly new technology that the FDA has approved for treating things like depression. Oh, the uh the probes? It's the actually a big or? magnet oh, and okay. it, you sit in a chair and the magnet sits over your head and it generates electrical current within your brain. You're awake, sitting there, maybe listening to music. And the idea is it's helping the nerve cells start to grow more effectively. My goodness, and that's T, what were those letters? TMS, okay. transcranial magnetic stimulation. Because I know deep brain stimulation yep. was featured in the Mayo Clinic movie that we and just that's, aired. that's huge for other conditions. Yeah, that was wonderful. You could see it 
how it helped. It was yep. really wonderful. Jen, one last question. One last question. How important is resiliency, resiliency training in schools? 20 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> it's important, yes. uh, but the, the end all and be all is you don't want to be resilient through something that you actually need to seek help for. Ah. Certain things, don't tough it out. If you're being abused, if you're going through trauma, if you're suicidal, don't tough it out. We're not looking for resilience. We're looking for you to stay safe. Wonderful. Fascinating discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, that's all the time we have for tonight. Our thanks to Dr. Karen Blacker, along with Jen Dalliger and the other RNs handling the phone calls here in the studio in Austin. Most of all, thank you for watching and sending in your questions. Next week, we're going to talk about hospitals and ERs. The number of visits to ERs keeps going up. Number of people heading to the hospital going down. We'll talk about why that is and what it means for all of us. Hope you can join us.